Hello, everybody. We're approaching the last concert of our set of three First Monday concerts, all of French music. And following that, we're going to get a nice holiday. So it's good. Everything's good. Um, we have three magnificent pieces to listen to today. And I'm going to talk to you about them in the order in which we present them. The first piece on the concert today is by the very great and well-known Maurice Ravel. Uh, Ravel, who was born in 1875 and died in 1937, came from southwestern part of France, almost near the Spanish border, south of Bordeaux. And his father was a very successful engineer who did well. And his father married a woman from the Basque region of Spain. This proved to be a very interesting combination because the Basque music pervades a lot of what Ravel wrote, interest with Spain. So that's, it comes by nature to him. In any case, um, both of his parents were Roman Catholic, religious people, and they both loved music. And this is, of course, a wonderful setting in which a young person who shows talent has a chance to develop it. Um, they moved to Paris practically just after Ravel was born. So he really is a Parisian all of his life, um, but born in that area near Spain. He was involved in music from a very young age. He had piano lessons like a lot of people start on. And um, actually, already by the age of 12, he was interested in composing. But this is pretty early. Uh, he wasn't exactly a prodigy, you know, like a Mendelssohn or a Mozart. But the interest was there and the eagerness to study was there. And um, so as I've said already, there's a lot of influence from Spain in his music. And uh, also another really interesting influence was when he was 14 years old, it was the time of the great international exposition in Paris. And at that time, young Ravel was very much taken with a lot of Russian music he heard there. Rimsky-Korsakov came there. and um, also gamelan music from Indonesia. So all of these very unusual uh, non-French sounds really captivated him. All of his life he was, he was not bound just to be French. He was really in, interested in so many other areas. He went to the Paris Conservatory and that was a time when the leadership of the conservatory was what we would call very old fashioned, at least in the minds of young musicians who really wanted to go in new ways. Uh, he wasn't really happy there. And um, he was serious about his piano playing, but again, he never really, that was not what he was going to be. Um, and in that period of time, various other things came into his life. There was a very interesting French composer named Eric Satie, uh, whom we know for a couple of pieces that he wrote. He wrote very little. The first piece called Three Pieces in the Form of a Pair. And that's unusual. So in other words, there was a lot of stuff of very unusual, non-traditional, old-fashioned uh, ideas going on. Well, it happened that he was so unhappy that he didn't do well at the conservatory and he was expelled in 1895, so at the age of 20. And it didn't stop him from wanting to study and grow and he did it in other ways. And a couple of years later, there was a big change at the conservatory because the old guard was pushed out and the very, very solid, more forward-looking composer, Gabriel Fauré, who's piece we're going to hear at the end of the program, became the director of the conservatory. And in fact, he became the composition teacher 
of Ravel. So Fauré was not just simply interested in his own music. He was interested in Wagner. He was interested in German music and Schumann and all kinds of other plays. And he saw to it that the young people that he was teaching were aware of what was happening in other places. And that was very stimulating to him. Um, at around that point, there were he was not the only person who felt like that. There were a group of what you might call rebellious young composers that formed into a club that they called themselves the Apaches. And in, in that period of time, he met his elder composer, who was more established, Claude Debussy. And he had nothing but absolute admiration for Debussy, but at the same time understood that Debussy's interest in what he was in doing in art was different from what he wanted, and they gradually drifted apart. The one thing that they shared in common was that both of them were called by the critics and writers as being impressionist composers, and neither of them liked that nomenclature. So in his life, there are a lot of very famous pieces. He wrote a string quartet, which is very famous and very much played in 1903. There are individual pieces that he worked and crafted very carefully on. This seemed to be a French attitude toward how you make things. You do them with care. He was so much of a tinkerer, he was known as the Swiss watchmaker because everything was just, just so. It seems his system at that time was to write a piece for piano and then make an orchestration for it. So some of the pieces in that period that we know today started out as piano pieces. Pavan for a Dead Princess, very beautiful piece. Um, Valse Noble Sentimental, Le Tombeau du Couperin, um, and Mother Goose. So all of these pieces became very famous, and yet they became famous not because he wrote them for the piano, but because that was the springboard for him to do an orchestral piece. And he was a fantastically good orchestrator. I would say that a big influence on him had to have been Rimsky-Korsakov, because that was the source of ideas about orchestration for Stravinsky and Debussy and everybody in the 1920s, so that was when he was in his mid-40s, he kind of slowed down. He wasn't writing very much. Um, but nonetheless, out of that period came some great pieces. Uh, the wonderful piece for violin and originally piano, but with orchestra at Sigan, based on the idea of gypsy music. He took the great piece of Mussorgsky called Pictures at an Exhibition, piano piece, and made it into an orchestration, which of course is where the way most people hear it now. The other thing was that he was interested in a lot of influences, so that when uh, in the early part of the century, Arnold Schoenberg had written a piece called Piero Lunaire, which was for a, a singing, a speaking singer, Sprechstimme, and a group of seven players. It got in his idea that he could do something with a voice and with a few players. So that brings us to the piece that we're going to listen to tonight, which is Chanson Madikas, or Madagascar songs. And he acknowledged Schoenberg as an influence in that. Um, I'm going to finish a little bit about his life before I go back to talk about the piece. Um, the last work in the 1920s was a strange piece. He was approached by a famous dancer to write a piece for her, and the piece turned out to be Bolero, which everybody knows. And what is Bolero? But it's one rhythm. Over and over again, and a melody, a very sinuous melody, and a crescendo. That's the whole piece. And what he said about that later was, um, I've written only one masterpiece, he said, Bolero. Unfortunately, there's no music in it. He was kind of, kind of uh, upset that he was famous for something that he 
was not his favorite thing. Anyway, around that time, in the, by 1930, he had an unfortunate accident in a taxi and he hit his head. And it's not quite sure what happened or what, but people had noticed already that he was beginning to get very hazy in his memory. And in fact, the rest of his life went very much downhill and he died maybe of something that was wrong with his brain or whatever, but he was gone in 1937. He's not a very old person. So now I want to come back to Chanson Maricas. In this piece, which is for a very small ensemble, flute, cello, piano, and mezzo, there is expressed in a little very compact way a very exotic set of ideas. This is based upon a set of poems by an 18th century poet who had lived in East Africa and his name was, it's a full name, Ebariste de Forge de Parmi. And he called them actually Madagascar poems. Maybe he'd never even been to Madagascar. Maybe what he was writing about was just kind of a fanciful image of what it was like. But I would say that the three elements in it were erotic, very much dealing with love and exotic, the strange group of people, and anger. And the anger was because Madagascar was a French colony. And I have a quote from him that I want to share with you about that. He wrote, I cannot take pleasure in a country in which my gaze cannot but fall on the sight of servitude, where the noise of whips and chains dizzies my ear and resounds in my heart. I see nothing but tyrants and slaves, and I do not see my fellow man. Every day a man is swapped for a horse. It's impossible for me to accustom myself to such a revolting oddity. So in this piece, we have all three of those things, and each one of them, each of the three movements expresses something. The first one is very, very about love, about relationships and love and all of that. The second one is absolutely, fiercely angry, in which one of the strong lines is, defy the whites. And the last one is, again, kind of a domestic vision of that life, which ends with the wonderful words, let's go make a meal. So there you have it. I mean, a very great composer writing very great music, always with great care and precision and mastery, coming to this work, which is of great political significance to, it, to us today. And, and he does it in a way that is so compelling and so beautiful that all we can do is what we're going to do right now, is listen to it. The second piece on our program today is the latest of all of the compositions that we will have heard during the entire set of three programs. It's written by the composer Henri Dutilleux, who was born in 1916. That places him solidly after Ravel and Debussy, and actually also after uh, Olivier Messiaen, whose great quartet for the end of time we heard last month. He, f he grew up in a family where I can't say there was much interest in music, but they supported him. He studied piano first and harmony, and he went to a special school where he was deemed talented, and they found a school for him in a small city called Douai, which is near Lille in the north of France, very close to Belgium. He was there for several years, and then finally in 1933, he would have been 17, he went to Paris. It's very hard 
to talk about in as a in a kind of a normal systematic way because the path that he chose was so strikingly original he was interested in new music for himself and he wrote a lot of music in the early part of his life that he threw away. He didn't consider that. That was how he wanted to be known, and so he just destroyed it. He did a lot of interesting jobs. He was actually from 1945, which means at the age of uh, almost 30, for almost 20 years, he was the director of music production for Radio France. He was just in the thick of everything. Um, he taught composition from 1961 to 1970, and he listened to what was going on around him and what interested him. Well, of course, he was influenced by Debussy and Ravel. Who couldn't be? But also he was very interested in composers from other countries, Béla Bartók from Hungary, Stravinsky from Russia. And in that whole period of time, the music that he was most fascinated by were the late quartets of Beethoven and the opera by Debussy, Pelléas et Mélisant. So he was, you get a picture of somebody who was looking at all kinds of influences and trying to figure out who he is. I think composers do that. They just kind of, at a certain point, they say, no, I'm not that, no, I'm not that, and then finally say, yeah, that's who I am. So he was, he was looking what was happening in new music on all sides. And there's a quote from him that I think is very interesting. He said, What I reject is the dogma and the authoritarianism which manifests themselves in that period. He was, I guess, reacting a little bit to the legacy of Schoenberg and all of the composers who were writing according to strict, formal, structural plans. And... Um, at the same time, just to mix it up, his favorite jazz artist was Sarah Vaughan. So he was, he was all over the map in terms of what he liked. He didn't write a lot of music, and he took, like Ravel, he took a lot of time to finish it. And maybe this quotation from him will give you a picture of him. He wrote, I always doubt my work. I always have regrets. That's why I revise my work so much, and at the same time, I regret not being more prolific. But the reason I am not more prolific is because I doubt my work <laughs> and spend a lot of time changing it. It's paradoxical, isn't it? I mean, he knew exactly what, what it was, but he was stuck into being who he wanted to be. So... He really charted his own path, and it's really like nobody else's music. It's very complicated, and I'll talk about that a little bit with today's piece. I think that when you listen to the music of Debussy, I always think, where did that come from? It came from some something inside of Debussy, and his ear heard distinctions of sounds in very, very new ways and with great clarity. And I, in my personal opinion, there is no composer after Debussy in France who comes as close as Henri de Tilleux to that attitude that sounds, how you make sounds, how they fit together in a very, very precisely organized way is what his music about. And what I hear when I listen, listen to his music is that incredibly discriminating ear of his that really sorts out sounds. Well, okay, let's talk a little bit about what he did in his life. Well, there comes somebody from my world who was a huge influence on composers. His, he was the great Soviet cellist Rostropovich. Rostropovich himself had studied composition, had studied in the Soviet Union with Prokofiev, had introduced new works by, by um, uh, Shostakovich and actually got in the habit that he wanted people to write new music for him. And so any composer that he felt he could persuade to write something for him, 
He not only asked them to, he sat on them practically until they did it. He was a very persuasive man. I knew him. And he was, that was, I would say, if you look back later about his legacy, it is the capacity that he was responsible for maybe 50 to 100 new pieces written for cello, maybe more. And um, so he approached Dutilleux and said, you have to write a piece for me. When Rostropovich said that, the operative thing is, you have to. You have no choice. And so he, in fact, did write a piece for Rostropovich, a concerto um, called Tout un, Tout un monde lointain, A Whole District World, which is a big piece for cello and orchestra and exceptionally strong piece, maybe among the few pieces that he wrote and of his period that really are setting a sta whole new standard for how to approach the combination of a solo instrument with an orchestra. He also was approached again by Rostropovich to write a piece in honor of the 70th birthday of a Swiss, com a Swiss conductor named Paul Zacher. Paul Zacher had a very unusual situation. He had married a woman who was the, the inheritor of the Hofmann LaRoche pharmaceutical fortune. And all he wanted and she wanted was that new pieces would be created with her money. So out of that period come great pieces by Bartok, the divertimento for strings, the music for strings, percussion, and celeste, uh, pieces by Stravinsky, pieces by just endless, boundless amount of people. And so Zacher himself, who was an okay conductor, but mostly a creator, when he turned to composers, um, that's a great gift from him. Like in that, in that Rostropovich shared it. So Rostropovich went to him and said, if you let me commission 12 composers of my choice to write pieces for solo cello, I will play all of them. On that list was Pierre Boulez, was Dutille, was um, Benjamin Britten, who wrote a very short thing just shortly before he died, uh, Halfter from Spain. The list is really very, very rich. And so the piece that he wrote for Rostropovich is called Three Strophes, Trois Strophes. And the first of them was written for the Rostropovich competition in 1976. Um, and then he added two more movements later. And that's a piece that I've played and cellists are playing it more and more now. It's another thing of like that. It's where the details are so startling. It comes from a man who feels beauty and interest in sounds and how you put them together. He's kind of, if we want to say a composer is somebody who composes or puts together a lot of different ideas. That is who Dutilleux was. So around the same time that the big cello was, concerto was written, he finished a string quartet, and that's what we're going to hear tonight. It's called Ainsi que la nuit, Thus the Night. And he started off, he was writing it for the Juilliard String Quartet, and he started off by writing some small, what he called, night pieces that he sent to them. And then as it developed, he found something to tie it all together. And without getting too technical, because I really want you as listeners to not think about this when you hear this piece, he chose, like Schoenberg had a 12-tone row, he had a six-tone cluster of notes, all based upon, I'll say it, on fourths, fifths, and the major second. Don't worry about that. It's just he had it, and that's what he used. And he was fascinated to figure out what he could do with those notes. And so what are the elements of it? He was interested in pizzicato, harmonics, dynamics, contrasts, and register. And all of those things play into 
how he was altogether as a composer and how he wrote this particular piece. It's a very, very great and very difficult piece and not very long. And what I'd like to ask you to do when you're listening to it is trying not to figure out what it is. Just sit back and see what it does for you. It will evoke emotions. It will invoke kinds of reactions. If you're looking for something with a theme and variations, you're not going to find it here. There are the themes, the six notes, and there are variations, what he does with all of them, but it's not anything that you're familiar with. So the message is unique, and that's what you should listen for. Last thing I want to say is that um, he had a very long life. He lived to the age of 97. He was still writing music. He had a good connection to our neighboring organization, the, the Boston Symphony. And um, that's about all I have to say about him, except that I really am so pleased that we're hearing this piece because it says something so unique from a man who heard in a very discriminating way. So listen and see what you think. The last work on our last program of the fall season is by Gabriel Fauré. That's a name that music lovers know, but I would say for a long time they didn't know. He was French. He was uh, born in the south of France in 1845. So that's earlier than the, the composers of the two pieces we've just heard. Uh, and there's nothing particularly special about his upbringing. Uh, his parents were good people. They were, mother was a housewife. His father was a successful businessman. Um, and Nobody in the family had much to do with music. I suppose they listened to it some, but it was not really what got them going. But somehow or other, when he was a young man living in that south of France, uh, he was, I think, uh, six, seven, eight years old. There was a church they went to, and in that was a, an instrument like a miniature organ. It was called, it's called a harmonium. And it's a pedal thing. You have to work, work your feet to make some air to make the sound going on. So in that way, it's like an organ. And this little boy fell in love with the sounds he could make on that. And every time he could spirit away and go over to the church when it was not occupied for some, and find that instrument, he would just sit there for hours fooling around with it. And there was a, an old lady in the region who happened to hear him doing that. And she went one day to his parents and said, you know, your son is really gifted for music. You should let him have some music education. So he was sent to Paris, age nine, to study in a, a newly formed music school, the sole purpose of which was to train people to become church musicians. So they learned lots of things about music, but the instrument of choice was the organ. And he learned how to play the organ. And um, the person who influenced him the most was none other than the very famous and loved composer Camille Saint-Saëns. Very, very successful composer. And Sasson found something very interesting about this little boy, Gabriel Fauré. And in fact, all through his life, it seems like Sasson, who was very successful and very connected, was there at the right moment with Fauré to guide him or push him into a, an opportunity. And they were friends for about 60 years. And it seemed like in Fauré's life, at every moment there was some critical juncture Saint-Saëns was there and helped him. So um, he became a church organist. And in the next years, it's kind of like what I see with our young people at the conservatory. They're training for a life in music. They have dreams to do this. They have times to do that. 
And then they get out of here and the reality is what are they going to do? And they do whatever is available to them. That's exactly what happened with Foray. He had jobs teaching, he had jobs playing the organ, and he really didn't start composing until he was in his early 30s. And he became the director of the conservatory. And I, th I think I mentioned when I was talking about Ravel that Ravel was one of his students there. And he began to write music and he wrote pieces that were increasingly uh, admired. Uh, rather early, he wrote a requiem for no particular purpose. So he was a church musician. He never wrote music for organ, which is interesting because he spent so much of his life as a professional organist. He wrote chamber works, he wrote violin sonatas, and maybe one of the greatest contributions was songs. Um, he had a very, very special ear for melody and also was more interested in newer ideas of music about repetitive rhythms and harmony that went off really into distant corners in his pieces. You never knew exactly how he got to that next key. Um, we can talk about his personal life. Uh, he fell in love with the daughter of a famous artist and she dumped him in a few months. And in a while, he married somebody, and everybody said, why did, he, why did he marry her? But anyway, they had a long marriage, but that didn't prevent him having a very active uh, romantic life that did not involve his wife. Maybe the most important um, was in his 40s, there was a woman named Emma Bardak, and that was a very, very intense relationship. And then she left him and married Debussy. So it's kind of all of these things revolve around. Anyway, um, I don't have too much more to say because his music is so beautiful and, and wonderful. I will say that as he got older, he began to get deaf and Actually, after he was fully deaf, like Beethoven as a young man, he wrote some of his most adventurous, modern-sounding pieces that still are a great challenge to listen to. Anyway, he wrote two piano quartets, and the first one in C minor is very commonly played. It's a beautiful piece in a very standard four movement with a scherzo, a slow movement, and a finale. He came back to it seven years later, that form. He somehow liked piano quartets. And he wrote the piece we're going to hear tonight in G minor with much more adventurous technical means, much more adventurous harmonies, and more complex, maybe put together, still in the exact same format as the earlier piano quartet. And and at the same time, there are things in this piece that are so astonishingly beautiful. The slow movement is like somebody casts a magic spell. It's, it's a wonderful piece. And it's a piece that makes me so happy that we finish our fall season with. It will carry you in your ears into wonderful holidays. And I wish you all that. 